Hey everybody, Bill Sky, the C++ guy, and we're going to do something quite a bit different. Um, we're going to be do dealing with a variable called an array. Now an array is kind of like, if you think of a simple array, it's kind of like the first row of a spreadsheet, and each column is a value in that array. That's what we call a one-dimensional array, is that you've got one row with multiple columns. Now the difference between an array in C and C++ and an array in a spreadsheet or a row in a spreadsheet is that an array in C and C++ all of the data must be the same data type. So they all must be integers, they all must be doubles, they all must be floats, they all must be chars. You can't change the data types or have mixed data types inside of an array. Where on a spreadsheet you can put anything you want in each column of the first row. So that's the biggest difference. Now there's also a thing called a two-dimensional array which we will touch on. And a two-dimensional array is like multiple rows and multiple columns like in a spreadsheet. And it has the same rule though is that every data item in that spreadsheet or in that array must be the same data type. And that's the largest difference between a spreadsheet and an array. Now some people might say, oh boy, that is limiting. Well, it hasn't been limiting for decades. Um, but other languages like Python, they allow you to have different data types in an array. Uh, but the problem with that is that you're not sure what the data type is of each column in each row in the array. So there are some pluses or minuses. Now there are ways around this where you can have different types of data in an array. We're not gonna really touch on those, but we're gonna take a look at how you create an array and then how you create a one-dimensional array, and then we're gonna to touch on then how you create a two-dimensional array. Let's get started. Okay, so I've got my uh, Eclipse up here and running. Now you can, like I, on all of my videos, you can use any integrated development environment you want. I'm gonna use Eclipse, and I'm gonna call this a CPP array. You can call it anything you'd like. And let's create our very first array and the array that I'm going to create is going to be a simple integer array so the way that you create an array is you specify the data type for the array in this case int um, if you want to make them um, un unsigned positive only you can say unsigned int. it doesn't matter whatever basic data type that you have in the language go ahead and put that in there then give it the array name so I'm going to call this an int array and maybe you might want to call it an unsigned a uint array. And then you specify the size. So I'm going to say that this is going to be 10. And you, you put that 10 in square brackets and then a semicolon. So there you go. So there is our unsigned array. Now, if you want to see what's in that array, we've gone ahead and allocated it. Something that we've talked about before, but we haven't actually seen a direct usage of it is a for loop. Now for loop is a really great loop for counting up or down, perfect for arrays. So let's go ahead and throw together a for loop and let's print off every value in that array. I'm gonna say for int i equals zero, i less than 10, i plus plus, and I'm gonna say c out and a new int array of i. So let's look a little closer at this because we've got a number of things that we're, we have to think about here. First of all, let's talk about the size of the array. Now this array has a size of 10, which means there's going to be 10 unsigned integers in that array. But why in the for loop do we start at zero? Well, the reason that we start at zero is because the first item in any array in C++ or Java for that matter always starts at position zero. It doesn't start at position one, starts at position zero. This is something that is all over computer science, it's just something you have to deal with. So everything starts at position zero. So the first item in this array will be position zero, the second item will be position one, the third item will be position two. So you take the item position, in that case three, you subtract one from it and the actual position number is a two. So the 10 items in the array, in the unsigned or integer array, go from 0 through 9. It's always one less than the total number of items in the array. And there's really an underlying reason for this. If you were to look at some of my assembler language videos, 
you might be able to glean the reason for that. But for this discussion, we're just going to say everything starts at zero. So our counter starts at zero and it keeps going as long as the counter is less than 10. The moment the counter becomes 10, we're now past the end of the array because the array goes from zero through nine. And then we increment the counter each time. And the next line of code I want to talk about is this one right here. We specify the array name and then in square brackets, we specify the position that we want to see out to the screen. And in this case, it's the counter I. So it'll be see out and un, un, unsigned int array zero, unsigned int array one, two, three, four, all the way through nine. And then once it becomes 10, the for loop ends and the program finishes. So let's go ahead and build this and let's see what we get. Okay, so this is on Linux and on Linux, if you notice, all the values are zero. Now that does not mean that the values were actually initialized to zero. That simply means that that memory where that array was created happened to have zeros in all those memory locations. So what did your teacher just say? Your teacher just said, creating an array does not initialize the memory to zero, initialize it to any kind of a default value. It just, it just allocates the memory and says, here's the data in the memory. Now what I would like to do is, I would like to look at and see how this works on Windows. So let's do that real quick. Let's see how this works on Windows so you can see the difference in operating systems. All right, so I just copied my code from my Linux Eclipse over to Windows, and I'm on Eclipse. Now, one thing to remember is that it doesn't matter if the integrated development environment you're on. It doesn't matter if you're on Eclipse, if you're on Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, Code Blocks. It doesn't matter what IDE you're on. It has to do with the compiler. It's how the compiler does it and also how the operating system does it. So this is the exact same code. In fact, I've got even got some blank lines that I don't like. But this is the exact same code that we had in Linux. And let's go ahead and build and run this. And let's see what it outputs. Notice on Eclipse, in Linux, what it did was, and I shouldn't even have said Eclipse, because it doesn't matter. On, on, on Linux, it was all zeros. But on Windows, there's a bunch of garbage in there. That means that the array was created, in this case, an uint array was created with 10 integers in it, unsigned integers in it but there was no initialization. That was the same case on Linux, but the difference is the way that Linux memory model is all set up. So what it does is it allocates the memory, it finds the memory, it does nothing with the memory, and it returns the address of that memory, kind of like the address of your house, back to your program so you can then use that memory. But it doesn't do anything with it. Now, this is actually really important. What can I do to initialize that memory? Well, I'm going to stay here in Windows, and let's actually initialize it. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to just copy this for loop. And instead of just C outing it, I'm just going to say, and this is the first time we actually modified the value in an array, I'm just going to say initialize it to zero. So just like I accessed each, each item in the array to C out it, to count it, I'm now using the exact same code to assign values to it. And what I'm going to do is I'm then going to copy this for loop that printed it so we can see what effect this second for loop did. And you can see the, the utility of the for loop, right, when it comes to arrays. It's unbelievable. All right, so let's take a look at what we've got. Okay, so now we didn't put any C outs in here. I think it would be a good idea. Um, let's go ahead and just say C out printing uninitialized array. So let's do that there. It's just going to be easier to figure out what's, what's happening. Um, and I'm going to say initializing the array. Initializing the array. And then down here, I'm going to say print initialized array. All right. So let's go ahead and build that and let's run it again. All right, so we're going to expand the console here a little bit, and let's take a look at what we've got. So I created the array, and I'm now saying printing the uninitialized array. All right, so here we go. So as you see, there's garbage in there. That's what programmers call garbage. It's memory in there that hasn't been cleared out. It might be somebody's password. 
That's why it's so important to make sure you clear out your variables before your program ends. But there's garbage in there because the initializing the array does not happen unless you tell it to do it. So that's what you have to do. And so after that, I said initializing the array, then I said printing the initialized array, and you can see that it got all printed, to, it got all initialized to zero. So that's how you access the values in an array for something like C out. That's how you access values in an array to modify it. And then there's the C out again. Uh, you can initialize it to anything you want as long as it's the same data type. So I'm going to initialize it now to 99s. Let's build and run it. And let's take a look at how the program works. And you can see that all of the values in the array are not now initialized to 99. Now what might be a little bit confusing to you is, well, wait a minute, the last time the program ran, it initialized all the variables in the, or all the values in the array to zero. So why when the program ran again, do we see diff, do, do we not see all zeros? Well, the reason for that is that every time the program runs, the operating system, may find memory in a different location in memory. It doesn't always give you the same exact location in memory. It, it might find you a different one. So in that case, you didn't initialize that memory. But in this case, it's all 99s. Let's run this again, and you can see the exact same thing happened, is that it just found another location in memory. Or I, I'm not actually sure exactly what the operating system is doing here. It might have something to do with the op, you know, with Eclipse, where it's how it's running, but it has nothing to do with initializing memory, creating an array. Now, this is one way of initializing an array. There's another way of initializing an array, where when you actually create the array, you can say equals curly bracket. And I always like to put another curly bracket just to make sure that I don't forget to put it. And then you put values in there. So I'm going to say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's make this a little bit more interesting. 0, 11, 12, or 22, 33, 44, 55, 66, 77, 88, 99. And that's 10 items. So let's save and build that. Oh, and let's, so let, let's go ahead and comment out the second print in the initialization. And we're just going to go ahead and do the first for loop. So by putting curly brackets with, a, with an assignment statement right to the left, or assignment symbol, you could say, I want to initialize all those values to those values. Now, this could be a problem if you had an array of size 10 million, right? You wouldn't want to do that. But we've got some, we've got some clues on how to do that. All right, so let's take a look at what happened now when I ran this program. You can see that every value in the array was initialized. Pretty cool, right? So you can initialize them. But what if I only want to initialize the first three. I can just get rid of all those other ones. So now the first three are going to be initialized. Let's see what happens. All right. Well, it did initialize the first three, but notice what else it did. It puts put all zeros in the rest of the array. So what has it actually done here? It says, okay, I saw that you wanted to put 0, 11, and 22 in the first three positions of the array. I'm going to fill up the rest of them with all zeros. That's a very nice shorthand method of initializing an array with all zeros. So I'm going to create another array. I'm going to make this 10,000. So by put oh did I put curly brackets yeah so by putting the assignment symbol equals curly bracket zero curly bracket you initialize the very first value in the array and then the C++ runtime or the C runtime says I'm just going to put zeros in all the rest it doesn't put in all the rest the last value that you put into that array initialization it just makes them all zeros as you can see down here so by putting zero in the first one it'll do the exact same thing it'll put zeros in all the rest. Now we could go ahead and print off all those items in the array. Um, instead of doing that, let's just go ahead and make zero on the first one and let's run it and you should see 10 zeros in there and you can see 10 zeros. So that is creating an array. It's creating an integer array is exactly what we did, an unsigned. We initialize the values in two ways. 
The two ways that we initialize the values was we used a for loop to initialize them one at a time. And then we also used the shorthand method to make them all zeros by putting the, the curly brackets. Now let's move on. We can actually create different types of arrays. So I'm going to create a double array called my double array. And I'm going to make that 20 in size. And I would like to initialize them to all zeros. So let's go ahead and ask the user to type in. And just so we don't have to type in 20, let's type in, uh, well, let's leave it as 20. I think that'd be good. And you'll see where I'm going to go with this. OK. So I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to create a while loop. And I'm not sure what I'm going to put in there. So I'm going to put some question marks. I'm not sure what the condition is going to be. And I'm going to say, see out, enter a float to put, or no, enter a floating point number. for the array, and then I'm going to see in, and let's create a variable called temp double. So we have to come up here and create our temp double. And because we're seeing into a numeric value, we have to kind of do the clear kin function. You don't have to create the function if you don't want. Um, you can just type the code in there, but I always like having my function there. And let's go ahead and pound include C limits. We need that. And you need that for the int max. All right. So things are looking pretty good. We don't have anything in the while loop. So what do we want to do? We want to say that if they type a negative 999, then um, that's when they want to leave the, the while loop. So I'm going to make that equal to 0. And I'm going to say while temp double is not equal to negative 999. I'm going to put a 0, 0.00 there. And then right here, I'm going to say negative 999 to quit. Now, you might wonder, why did he put 0, 0.00 there? Well, you want to make sure that you're comparing the same data types in a while loop. If I did this, I might get a warning by the compiler telling me that I'm, te I'm testing a double and an integer. Why is that a problem? Because floating point numbers are stored in memory completely differently than integer variables. So, I mean, really, it's really, really different. So by doing this, you're comparing, kind of comparing maybe rotten apples with good apples, you know, because they're both numbers, but they're just not stored the same. But by putting dot zero zero there, you're forcing it to compare the temp double, which is a double, and the literal double, which is negative 999.00, so the compiler is going to behave a lot better. Okay. So, okay, so we went ahead and did that. Now, we didn't store it anywhere, so I have to do something like this. I have to say, and u int array um, equals temp double. Well, I can't do that because what I'm doing is I'm storing a double in a pointer to the array, which we haven't really talked about much, so that won't work. So I've got to put something in brackets here. Um, how am I going to do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another variable, array counter. I'm going to make that equal to zero. And right before the uh, uh, while loop starts, I'm going to say array counter. And why am I doing this? Just in case array counter got messed up or got changed somewhere above that while loop, I'm making sure that I initialize it correctly. So I'm going to put that in here. I'm going to say array counter. OK. Now, the array counter can also be thought of as the size of the array. And you're going to see what I mean by that in just a moment. So after the user types negative 9, or after the user types a number, we're going to store it in the array. And then we're going to increment. So we're going to say array counter plus plus. Now, after the user puts a number in the array, we've got one item in the array, right? And that's what array counter has. It has one number in the array. Now there's also another problem here is that what if the user actually types negative 999? We're storing negative 999 in there. So we're gonna do, wanna do something here. We might wanna say if temp double 
is equal to negative 999. I'm going to say continue. Well, I want to spell continue right. Else, and let's go ahead and store it. Okay, so some pretty some pretty common code where you're doing user input. We could have used the do while, but I still think you have the same problem. All right, great. So what is our while loop doing here? Let's walk through it really quickly. It's setting up a ray counter to zero. It's going to keep going while temp double is not equal to negative nine nine nine. We're going to ask the user enter a floating point number. We're going to see in into that. Oh, we didn't do the clear kin. Always important to do a clear kin. We check to see if it's negative 999. If it is, we continue. Then the while loop will leave. The, the while loop will end. Um, else, if it's not equal to negative 999, we're going to go ahead and assign it to that position, to the array counter position in the array. And we're going to continue. Now, there's also another problem here, which we haven't really talked about. You as the programmer, there's nothing in the compiler, there's nothing in the program, the language that's going to stop you from entering 500 items into this array, even though that array can only hold how many? It can only hold 20. So you have to also, you have to make sure that you don't go past that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, while temp double is not equal to negative 999 and array counter is not equal to 20 or as long as it's less than 20 that might even be better so that while loop will check for both of those conditions now this is just um, this is just style I always like to put my conditions if I have multiple conditions in a while loop I always like to put them in parentheses okay so there, so let what is this is called? This is called bounds checking. You, the compiler, the program, the operating system, the runtime, nobody is going to make sure that you haven't gone past or before the array. So you have got to keep track to make absolutely sure you're staying within those bounds. Now, I don't know if you noticed when I was doing this, I had to scroll up to find out how many items we're in the array. Well, there's another thing that you should think about doing, and that's creating a constant, a constant int called double size, or I don't know, d array size maybe. And by doing that, you can allocate the array with that, and you can also check it using that constant. You don't have to go looking through your code again. You know what the what the uh, constant name is that's going to keep track. Also, if you're going to be making changes to the program, you only have to change the array in one place. You don't have to go through and change it everywhere. That's kind of the same thing with the integer array, right? Is the integer array has the hard coded ten? You might want to create another constant in array size and put that constant in there and if you don't do that no remember the very first three for loops we did you'd have to change it in every place if you decide to change the number of items in the array in this case you only have to change it in one place so constants are really important when you're dealing with arrays. All right, so let's take a look at this. Um, all right, so it's going to go ahead and it's going to enter all that, or you're going to enter all that data. Uh, this part of the while loop will make sure you don't enter 21 items when it only has space for 20. This one right here will make sure that the user still wants to continue. Now, what do we want to do with this when we're done? Well, let's just go ahead and print it. So I'm just going to copy this for loop here that's been commented out. And I'm just going to say, printed double array. 
And it wasn't I array size, it was double array size. And I'm just going to see out. Oh, I've made some mistakes here. I'll see you in just a minute. Um, so let me see, what was it? Uh, D, or what was, well, I got to remember these variable names. My double array, that was it. And by doing this, I also found out I was assigning the double to the integer array. Oops. So, okay, good. I'm catching these errors before I even compile it. Okay, I do have to put a square bracket here. All right. So let's go ahead and see how this works. All right, so it did our integer thing. So now it says enter a floating point number. I'm gonna say 11.11, 12.12, 13.13, 13. and I'm gonna say negative 999. All right, well, well, a lot of zeros. Okay, so what happened here? This worked, believe it or not, this worked. It printed 11.11, .11, it printed 12.12, .12, it printed 13.13. .13. But guess what else it did? It printed all of the zeros that were left in that array because that array had 20 items in it. It printed all the zeros. Why do I care about that? Why do I care about all the zeros? What if I wanted to average all those numbers up and the user only typed in three numbers? Well, I don't want to divide it by 20. You know, what if it's your GPA and you've only got taken three tests and your teacher's gonna divide that by 20? Your GPA is gonna plummet, right? So the array might be able to hold 20, but how many is it actually holding? It's actually holding an array counter. An array counter specifies how many items the user actually entered in the array. So instead of saying less than the entire size, I'm gonna say less than array counter. And let's try that exact same test again. All right, 11.11, 12.12, .12, 13.13 negative 999. Much better. 11.11, 12.12, 13.13. Well, so this is an example of an array that's pretty large. I mean, well, I wouldn't say that, but an array that's got 20 items that you can in input into, but you're keeping track of only the number of items that have actually been put into the array. Very important concept. You need to keep some type of of a counter, some type of an array size variable to keep track of how many items you actually have in the array. Almost think of it like a subarray. And the way that I'm gonna do that is right below the my double array, I'm gonna say int my double array. Mm, count. So instead of using array counter, I'm going to change that to my double array count. And this again is just for consistency, make more sense with your variable names. And we're going to have to change it in a few places. All right. So, oh, I forgot to change it here. Let's see how this still works. All right, seemed to still work, except I noticed that I had some build problems. I'm gonna go up here to project clean, because I wanna force it to, to um, recompile. And I'm gonna say build all. So let me see, what was this? Oh, unused, I never, okay. So I changed my variable to my double array count. Um, array counter was just some generic uh, variable and I'm just not using it anymore, but I might use it later on. So I, I might clean that up uh, later on if I'm not gonna be using it, but I'm not done with the program yet. Okay, so let's do one last thing. Let's run this and let's put in try to put in 21 floats. So I'm just gonna say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And what I'm doing is I'm testing to make sure that I'm not going out of bounds. Ah, so it would not let me do it. So that's kind of cool. I didn't say negative 999 anywhere, it just went ahead and ended. And the reason it ended was because of this 
this and condition to make sure that I didn't go over the size of the array. Um, what happens if I, what happens if I put something there that's ridiculous? What if the size of the array is 20, but I put 50? And I'm just going to do that on the see out loop. Let's go ahead and save and build that. Let's run it. And I'm going to put 10, 20, negative 999. Well, let's see what it did. Okay, we've got a bunch of garbage in there. So I entered my, two, I entered two, and we see a bunch of zeros, but now we see a bunch of garbage. This is memory that is past the array that might have some really important meaning to it. It might be a password, it might be a bank account number, it might be a bank account balance. It could be something very, very important. And you don't want to overwrite that. What if this just wasn't a C out? What if I was actually putting data in there? Well, Windows let me do it. However, other operating systems like Linux or Mac OS, Unix operating systems, may just kill the program right away. But you don't want to, I mean, again, let's go back to that example of your teacher averaging up your scores. If your teacher wasn't doing it correctly, wrote the program correctly, they would be averaging your score with 6.9513 times 10 to the negative 310. Talk about a reduction in your grade point average. So again, it's very important to make absolutely sure that you keep the bounds, you, you adhere to the bounds of the array. Very, very important. So let's do another array. Let's do an array of strings. So I'm going to create another array here. I'm going to say string my name array. And let's just do the i array size. Let's do the, and that's just the 10. And I'm going to say that's equal to, well, I don't want to, I don't need to initialize strings. Strings are really different. Um, every time you create a string, it automatically initializes it to blank. So I don't really have to initialize strings. String arrays, I should say, or strings for that matter. So let's go ahead and just make that my name array and not initialize it. All right. So let's go ahead and now create a for loop. So I'm going to say this is different than a while loop. I'm going to say for int i equals zero, i less than i array. Let me see if I could, there it is, i plus plus. Now this is another way to process arrays for entering data. I'm going to say c out. Please enter a name for the name array. And I'm going to say again, negative 999 to quit. And I'm going to say get line from kin. Oh, we need a variable. So I'm going to jump up here. And I'm going to say string temp. Oh, let's call it temp name. Also, something else I didn't do is I didn't say my name array count. I didn't create a counter to keep track of how many names the user actually counted it or input into the array. So I'm going to say get line temp. Oh, there's my temp name. If any of you are wondering how I'm doing that, having it jump jump up the list of things that begin with temp, I'm on Windows. I'm pressing control space, the control key on my keyboard, and then space. And that gives me a list of things that it might be. Okay, so we kind of have to do the same thing with a for loop. I'm going to say if temp name is equal to negative 999, I'm going to break. Else, I'm going to go ahead and add that item to the array. So I'm going to say, oh, what did I call it? I said name, nope. I forgot the name of my array. The name of my array is my name array. So let's copy that and paste it down there. My name array, and I'm, gonna, I'm using the i counter in this for loop, is equal to temp name. Now we still don't, we're, we haven't kept track of the number of items that we've typed in the array, but the for loop is counting for us, isn't it? It's saying i equals zero. So we could create the counter, we could have the counter, and what was the, oh, so it was my name array counter, count. I could do it there, or I could take away the int here, 
or I could put my name array count here in I. So then I wouldn't have to do this. And let me show you that. So instead of saying I, I'm going to say my name array count. My name array count. Make it a little bit. Would this be more efficient? Yes. There we go. So my for loop is keeping track of the count for me. So if the user types negative 999 the very first time they enter anything in, my name array count is zero. Also notice I didn't put an int here. If I put an int here, I'm now, I now have a second variable called my name array account. My name array count, which is only available in the for loop. So by taking out the int, we're using the my name array count, which was defined up above, so I can use it later. All right, so now let's go ahead and just print all those names the user typed in. So I'm going to copy my for loop. And instead of my double array count, I'm going to use my name array count. Instead of my double array, I'm going to use my name array. All right, let's see how this works. OK, 11, 12, minus 999. All right, great. Please enter a name, uh, Sam, Tammy, Kathy, uh, Mary, Sue, Fred, minus 999. Boy, this is working out great. Also, by using this external counter, you also have the total number of pieces of data to you let the user, you know, let them know. So I can say count you entered. Whoops. My name array count names. Here they are. So you've also got a counter. And that counter should only change if you add or remove items from the array. So let's see how that works. That's kind of neat. The other thing that the counter can be used for is for averaging, which we're going to do next. So 11, 12, minus 999. All right, Bill, Terry, Sue, Mary, minus 999. And there you entered four names. Now, I didn't put a space there, so I should have probably done that. Okay, so you can use that. So let's let's do what I promised you. Let's do an average. So I want to average up those floating point numbers that the user typed in. Okay. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say see out the average of your floating point numbers is, and I'm going to average them up. Now I need an average variable. So let me see, um, temp double, I think that'll work. So I'm gonna create a for loop here. Now I could actually put this inside of this for loop, but that for loop is just for printing. So, um, and it is not, this is not as efficient as doing it in there, but I'm gonna do it anyway this way. So I'm gonna initialize temp double equal to zero and then I'm going to say temp double plus equals my double array of i. Okay, so I'm going to add them all up and I'm going to say temp double equals temp double divided by my double array count. And then I'm going to see out temp double. Now this see out will print all in one line because we didn't print an end L anywhere after we printed this until the very end. All right, let's see if that works. Now the way that I like to test out um, mathematical formulas like this is just put some very basic things in there. So I'm going to say 11.11.11.11. One, one one, 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 one. I'm going to say negative 999. 
and the average is 11.11, so that's great. So it took 11.11, added it again, that's 22.22, divide that by two, that's 11.11. All right, great. So I'm gonna say negative 999 on the string. All right, let's try this again. You always wanna test your code to break it. So I'm gonna say, uh, let's do some simple things. I'm gonna say 500 and 1,000. So that'll be 1,500, the, the average should be 750, right? And there it is, 750. So our averaging is, is working. And that's why these counters, keeping track of how many items you actually have in an array, are so important because you're keeping track. You're, very rarely will arrays be, have the exact amount of data that's the size of the array. That's very, very rare to happen. So it's always a good idea to have some sort of a counter that keeps track of it. Wow, that was a lot of coding, but that was a lot of fun, right? I love arrays. There is gonna be another video when we talk about advanced functions, how you can send an array to a function and let that function print the array. Like for instance, we have a lot of code here that printed the array over and over again, right? Wouldn't it be nice if you had a function that you sent the array to and let that function do it so you only had to write that code one time and then just call the function? So we're gonna be doing that in the advanced functions video that's coming right after this. And then there will also be some discussions of arrays in, 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 in following videos as well. But that's a good demonstration, a good introduction to arrays. Hope to see it in our next video.